If you will remain standing uh, and invite one another to uh, greet each other with the peace of Jesus Christ, the grace of Jesus Christ, and we'll see if I can get some of this uh, microphone stuff figured out while we do this. How about that? I have a good idea.
sing it to the older All who hunger, all who thirst All the last and all the first All the paupers and the princes All who fail and then forgive All who dream and all who suffer All who love and lost and never All the chain and all the free All who follow, all who We have so many opportunities uh, as Christians to come to the table, uh, so to speak. We'll have a very literal way to do that this morning as we come and participate in communion. But we get to come to the table over and over and over again. And one of the ways we do that is through our prayers. Um, and our loving of one another. So let us remember those in our community who are sick, those who are recovering, uh, those who are grieving, uh, those who are healing, as we go to God, as we come to the table in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, in the midst of the distractions, in the midst of the things that go wrong, in the midst of all of the stuff we don't always understand, the sickness and the hurt and the pain and the brokenness and the grief. God, we know that you are still there, that you are still God, that you still walk with us on life's journey, that you still love us no matter what. God, we're so grateful for that because we know that it's not always deserved, but it's always given. God, we ask that you would continue to be with us as we reflect on our own lives, as we begin to think about the ways that you have impacted our lives and the ways that we talk about that with people. God, help us to recognize how our very lives, the lives that we live, our witnesses, in their own right, and then help us to be able to speak those words of life into the lives of those that we care about and the lives of those who are new to us. God, we remember the ways that you continue to serve us, and so we seek to live into that image of service and love. God, we recognize that there are those around the world who need to experience that love and acceptance. We recognize that there are people who are hurting all over the world. Some of the things they go through we understand. Some of them we don't. Help us to be your compassionate and giving people when it comes to reaching those across the world, whether it just be as simple as saying a prayer for our brothers and sisters across the globe, whether it be going and doing for them, whether it be accepting them when they come to our part of the world. God, give us hearts for mission and service and witness to those who may not have heard your story in a way that's accessible to them. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Our scripture this morning comes from 1 Peter. It's chapter 3, verses 8 through 17. And it comes from the Common English Version of the Bible. Finally, all of you be of one mind, sympathetic, lovers of your fellow believers, compassionate and modest in your opinion of yourselves. Don't pay back evil for evil or insult for insult. Instead, give blessing in return. You are called to do this so that you might inherit a blessing. For those who want to love life and see good days should keep their tongue from evil speaking and their lips from speaking lies. They should shun evil and do good, seek peace and chase after it. The Lord's eyes are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord cannot tolerate those who do evil. Who will harm you if you are zealous for good? But happy are you even if you suffer because of righteousness. Don't be terrified or upset by them. Instead, regard Christ as holy in your hearts. Whenever anyone asks you to speak of your hope, be ready to defend it. Yet do this with respectful humility, maintaining a good conscience. Act in this way so that those who malign your good lifestyle in Christ may be ashamed when they slander you. It's better to suffer for doing good, if this could possibly be God's will, than for doing evil. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Loving God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. Who will be a witness for my Lord? Who will be a witness for my Lord? Who will be a witness for my Lord? I will be a witness for my Lord. Y'all sing it with me. Who will be a witness for my Lord? Who will be a witness for my Lord? Who will be a witness for my Lord? For my Lord. This whole sermon series, we're talking five weeks, this song has been stuck in my head. Who will be a witness for my Lord? What do you think of when you think of a witness? Now this is the part where I told you it was going to be a little interactive this morning. When you think of witness, what do you think? Not a rhetorical question. Court, yeah, law, right? We think of witnesses who stand up and testify about something. What else? Yeah, you can see something happen, right? You witness an accident or something like that. Mm -hmm. What else? Give an account of something, right? You saw it and then you tell about it. Mm -hmm. Standing by that person? Yes. Yes. What else? Tell people about God. Yeah, so witnessing about our faith. Mm -hmm. We'll talk a little more about that in the sermon today. Anything else? Act out and live. Act out and live what you believe. Mm -hmm. Witnessing through action, right? Yeah, who will be a witness for my Lord? What do you think that means? I wonder. In our scripture this morning, uh, verses 8 through 14, uh, which are a significant portion of the scripture, they talk about what it looks like to live as Christians, what it looks like to witness with our lives, with our actions. This is what it looks like, our, our scripture says, to be of one mind. That is, don't let the little things divide you. Be of one mind. Be sympathetic. Be lovers of your fellow believers. Be compassionate. Right? These are about how to care for each other, how to listen to one another, how to be there for each other as a community. Be modest in your opinion of yourselves. Don't think that you're always right. 
That's a hard one for me sometimes. I'm sure none of you always think you're right, <laughs> but that's a hard one for me. Be modest in your opinion about yourself. Sometimes it's real easy to get convinced that we have the answers. But what if we don't always have the answers? At least we should consider that possibility, right? Don't pay back evil for evil or insult for insult. Instead, give a blessing in return. You are called to do this so you might inherit a blessing. This is that turn the turn the other cheek stuff that we don't like very much. We would much prefer, Jesus even says, um, you have heard that it is said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We hear that, that that said quite a bit. You know, if someone hurts me, make sure I hurt them back. But this turning the other cheek stuff, this forgiveness stuff, this not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult stuff, that's hard. And yet these are characteristics of a Christ follower, our scripture says. And then it sort of suggests that people are going to notice, right? People are going to notice when you're living your life like this. Because non-followers, they let the little things that they argue about get in the way of friendships with one another. While followers don't do that. Followers love each other in spite of their differences. And non-followers... They only love the people who are like them, but followers, they love their enemies. And non-followers, they think of themselves first, but followers, they think of others first. Non-followers, they puff themselves up and they boast about how they're right, but followers consider the possibility that they could be wrong and know where their strength comes from. It's from God, not from self. Non-followers, they get revenge. It's that eye for eye stuff. But followers, they seek to forgive. People notice when you're living in this way. People notice that your life looks different. That's a part of what it is to witness. Who do you think of when you think of witnesses for Christ? Who do you think of when you think of a model Christian. I think of, so big picture people, I think of people like Mother Teresa, who left her world behind and went to go live in Calcutta, India, among the poor and serve them. Right? That's compassion. We see compassion in our scripture. I think of Martin Luther King Jr., who worked tirelessly for civil rights of all people in the United States. Right? Justice. I think of smaller figures too, people in my own life, people who have been model Christians in my world, people like my dad, who would drive up to a gas station and be approached by someone who looked pretty shabby and gross, who wanted to wash his windshield. We lived in Dallas, so there were a lot more big city uh, gas stations like that. And he would say, okay, and give him a few dollars. You know, kindness. I think of people like Janice Virtue. She's one of my mentors. She's also a person who trains um, a bunch of clergy people, particularly young clergy people. And um, I know this isn't true of your young clergy person, but some young clergy people are very excited about what they do and very energetic and all over the place. And she's got to rein those people in and kind of teach them um, a method, a way that's helpful takes a lot of patience, takes a lot of being vulnerable and a lot of trust of us. What do you think of, who do you think of when you think of a model Christian? What does that look like? Who are the people that witness with their lives? I bet they meet several of the characteristics that our scripture talks about, right? Forgiveness, or being compassionate, or being sympathetic, or loving your fellow believers, when did you first notice that their lives looked a little different? Did you ever have a chance to talk to them about it? Did they ever tell you why their lives looked different? People notice when your life reflects the love of Christ. People notice. And when they notice, they may ask you for advice. They may come up to you and say, how do you do it? How 
do you not return evil for evil? How do you forgive those crazy people? How do you do it? Whenever anyone asks you to speak of your hope, be ready to defend it. That means we've got to talk about it, too. Witnessing is not just about living by example. It's also about telling people why you live as you do. Be prepared to speak about the hope you know in Jesus Christ when others ask you about it. When friends are talking about vengeance and they come to you and they say, oh, this person really messed with my life and I'm really just wanting to like cut them off and I really just want to tell all of their friends about how horrible they are so that they won't be friends with them anymore. It's our job to say, well, you know, I live a way of forgiveness because I've been forgiven by Christ and because I know that I've been in that place where I've done something that was harmful to someone else and I'm called to forgive as I'm forgiven because of the love of God I know in my life. Or when that friend comes to you and wants to talk to you about um, how horrible someone is and they're not uh, tolerating their actions very well because they're very different and they think differently and they look a little different from them. And they ask you how you can be so tolerant of people that don't think and act like you. Then it's our job to say, well, I accept my neighbors for their differences because God loves me no matter what, and surely there's something that I think or do that's not acceptable in God's sight, and yet I've received that tolerance from a loving God, so I'm called to be that person. Or if a friend comes up and asks you, uh, tells you about how they really, really hate someone, Hate's a strong word, isn't it? Most people don't say, I hate X, Y, and Z. Most people say, I can't stand so-and-so. I can't stand them. When someone's saying, I just can't stand that person or that group of people, it's our job when they ask us, how do you do it? How are you compassionate? To say, I'm compassionate because of the love of Christ that I know. I'm compassionate because I've done some pretty horrible things, things that I shouldn't have done, things I knew I shouldn't have done, and yet I received compassion from Christ. So I'm called to be that compassionate person for others. When people notice your life is different, be prepared to tell them why your life is different. It's the hope we have in Jesus Christ. It's the way we know the love of Christ in our own lives and are called to express that like Christ did in the world. It's because you believe that God has influenced who you are. Do you not? Why would you be here otherwise? Do you, do you not believe that Jesus has influenced your life in some way? God has changed how we think how we act, how we believe. We're called to express that, especially when opportunity presents itself. When you do tell people of your relationship with Christ, do it respectfully. Regard Christ as holy in your hearts. Whenever anyone asks you to speak of your hope, be ready to defend it. Yet, do this with respectful humility maintaining a good conscience. Act in this way so that those who malign your good lifestyle in Christ may be ashamed when they slander you. It's better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Be prepared to tell people about your relationship with Jesus, and when you do, do it respectfully. Do it with humility. Do it in a way that's honorable. Do it with consideration then instead of being able to make fun of you and just writing you off as that crazy Christian zealot, people can hear it in a way that they wouldn't have been able to hear it before. When we think about evangelism, we often think about people like going and knocking on doors and asking the question, um, you know, is Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior? And then I can tell you how to do that. Now, I'm not trying to offend anyone in here, but I cannot roll my eyes hard enough at that. 
because it's hard for people to hear that. It, people feel attacked when you approach them in that way. Be respectful. Be honorable. When you're calm and you speak the truth that you know about how God has been working in your life, you make God's story accessible to people who may not be able to hear it otherwise. When people ask me how I come to, people sometimes ask me how I came to be a pastor, right? That's a normal question because sometimes here in the Deep South, we don't see young female pastors up in the pulpit. Um, so I could tell that story a couple of different ways. I could tell that story by saying, well, I grew up in the church, loved the church, had a good time, um, moved on to college where I started being a psychology major and then fell into being a religious studies major instead because I liked it better. And then um, from there, I mean, the only logical way was to go forward into seminary because that's what I was really interested in was God and theology. And from there, I went to um, be a candidate in the United Methodist Church, and I learned a lot, and I grew, and I became ordained, and that's how I became a pastor. I could say that. I could tell the how. Or I could say, well, you know, I don't have a lot of memories of being in the church as a young child, but what I do remember is the love that people showed me. I always felt loved at church. I always felt like that was a place for me. And that continued into my youth years. You know, I had some crazy moments as a youth, and I had a lot of crazy questions, but people were patient with me, and they listened to my questions. And we talked about them, and we didn't always get the answers, but I could tell that God was doing something within me. God was growing me, and changing me, and preparing me for something. And I started to believe that maybe I was called to be a bigger part of leadership in the church. I wasn't sure what that meant exactly. And when I got to college, I had some more formative experiences. I was in the Christian Leadership Center where we learned to debate. You know, it was okay for Christians to see things differently and we had tough conversations. And God really grew me in the midst of that process. And my call to ministry got a little bit clearer because I was being changed. I was being transformed by those relationships. And God put some of the right people in my life at the right time, mentors who told me about what it was to be a pastor. And people who came to me when I was having a hard time doing some of these very things, forgiving people and being compassionate. And they spoke those words into my life. And so when I made the decision to go to seminary, I knew that I was called to be ordained because of that transformative work of God in my life. I didn't know if I was going to be deacon or elder, and so I did what people tell you never to do, which is make a deal with God. And I said, God, if I like my preaching course, I'll go ahead. I'll be an elder. I loved my preaching course, and I knew that deep down, God was honoring that deal, and God was asking me to move forward into ministry to become a pastor. Do you see the difference in those stories? Do you see how one honors my achievements and the way I did things, and how one points to how God was working in my life? Do you see the difference in those two stories? See, being a witness isn't necessarily about telling every detail of your life to people. It's about saying, God was a part of this, and God changed me in this way, and God has made me a new person, and that's how I do what I do. We are called to be witnesses through our actions, and through our words. Get ready to be a little bit uncomfortable. I'm preparing you now. I'm going to give you three minutes, maybe a little more if y'all are having really good conversation, but I'm going to give you three minutes 
And I'm going to ask you to think about a way that God has changed your life and share it with one of the people around you. This is your chance to practice being a witness. Because if we can't do it here with other believers, then we can't do it out in the world. So I'm going to give you maybe like a minute to think about it, okay? The question is, how has God helped to change your life, right? How has God been working in your life? Let's take just a little bit of time, and I'll tell you when to turn and talk to your neighbor. How about that? Some of you are introverts like me and have to think about it for a moment. So we'll, we'll take just a minute to think. And then I'm going to invite you to talk, to tell your story.
here's hoping we learn to do that. And we're able to recognize those opportunities when they arise. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, indeed, you change our lives. We know this, and yet sometimes it is hard to talk to someone about what that looks like. And God, sometimes we even feel like because we're not perfect, we shouldn't be the ones talking about it. But deep down, we know that we are all imperfect, that none of us, that all of us fall short of the glory of God. We pray that you would help to give us confidence and help us to recognize the moments when people need to hear the hope of Jesus Christ in their lives so that we might be able to be your witnesses and our lives might, and our words, our lives and our words might point to your goodness and your grace and your love first and foremost. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to pull out your hymnals. We have a few minutes where we're going to be able to sing with one another the songs that speak to our hearts, um, whatever they may be. Does anyone need a hymn list? Raise your hand if you do. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got one? Okay. Anyone else? All right, we're good then. Um, how this works is I'm going to invite you to call out the number of the hymn you would like to sing. Um, and I will lead us in singing the first and last verses of those hymns. Um, let's see. I need a hymn list. 314. Okay. 314. I come to the God. Oh, sorry, y'all, y'all don't have it yet. Yeah. Three, one, four, three, fourteen. Are we good? Okay. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on. Then see. 
sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. And Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. Yes, that's a good one. We haven't sung this one in a while, have we? <laughs> holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity, holy, Four fifty one and Marilyn, I saw you. We'll come back. Four four fifty one. Be the my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that Thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, Thy presence my Seven zero one. Okay. Haven't heard this one in a while either. Okay. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace in the mansions bright and blessed. He'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day!
One more. 514, is that what we heard? Okay. Can you hold it for next time, Dalton? Okay. 514. Ah, this is such an appropriate one to uh, end on, isn't it? Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victim sorry, to
and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, and to announce the time had come when you would save your people. That's us. When you would save your people. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, he ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he gave thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Let us pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, Wait. and the glory forever. Amen. You didn't see that. As we take from the loaf, we remember that, um, yes, we are a broken people, but we are a people who find healing and wholeness through Jesus Ew. Christ. As we drink from the cup, we remember and we celebrate, but we also relive the resurrection of Christ in our lives. I would invite those who are serving to come at this time. As you come to the table, um, I would encourage you to stay and kneel at the altar rail as long as you like to have a word with God. Um, if you should choose to leave an offering at the altar rail, those offerings go toward people who come uh, to us in times of crisis in their lives. Um, they don't go to the building fund or anything like that. They, gym, they, they go to the people who need them the most. Um, I would remind you that we take by intinction. Intinction is one of the oldest forms of communion where you'll be given a piece of bread and invited to dip it in the cup and to receive in that way. Yeah. This is how the disciples sort of take in communion um, and we celebrate as modern day disciples with Christ. Um, we do not have a band today, so I will invite you to uh, come as you are able and um, and receive. Stop there. Okay, we'll come to the table again. Come feast.
As we uh, move forward and as we prepare to leave this place, um, I would encourage you to think about who will be a witness for my Lord and what that looks like for you. Um, there are a couple of people as we're coming to the end of our series who have decided they'd like to make a commitment to, the, to this church. So I'm going to call um, Holly and Addison Hoffman forward and they are going to join our church today. We're very excited to have them. Um, Holly and Addison are transferring their membership from another congregation. Um, and they, you've probably seen them around. They, um, they have been a part of our congregation for what, maybe about a year now? Uh -huh, close to a year. And um, Addison, you will recognize from getting her third grade Bible a few weeks ago. And um, this has been a big month for y'all, hasn't it? <laughs> Um, for those who are transferring membership and joining the church, we ask a few questions. Um, I put it into one question. Right? Will you um, support the United Methodist Church, particularly Summer Grove United Methodist Church, with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If you will, say, we will. All right, come on, we will, yeah. All right, so, um, congregation, if meet, meet your newest members, Holly and Addison, and um, let's let's give them a round of applause and uh, cheer for the new fashion. We're excited to have y'all, so and um, you know as well as the rest of you that we provide ways for um, you to participate in the life of the church, ways to embrace, grow, and serve um, it, outside of Sunday mornings. So. One of those ways is by participating in our next study that's coming up. It's called Enough, and it's based on a book by Adam Hamilton. We'll be using that as a guide for our worship series, uh, but we also encourage you to do that in your groups, whether that be Sunday school, there's going to be a Tuesday morning group that's starting this week, um, and there will be a Monday night group that starts next Monday, so today, uh, tomorrow is Labor Day. Um, We've also been having some conversations in trustees about uh, how we can make Critchlow Hall um, a more hospitable place for more groups. And one of those things is by um, investing in a basketball goal that will remain standard size, but that will be able to go up against the wall if we need that space. Uh, we use that space for pickleball and for some things where you throw balls up in the air and it, it can get in the way sometimes. So that would be helpful to be able to have something that uh, moves up to its standard size and back against the wall and gives us a little more space. Um, if you, that's something that you're interested in participating in financing, we have a list uh, in Critchlow Hall. If you'll just put your name down, you don't need to put how much you're giving or anything like that, just if you're interested in financing that, um, we would appreciate knowing who you are. So uh, please think about ways that you can be a witness, both in the way you act and the way you live and the way you tell your story. And I was serious when I said you can set up an appointment to, uh, with me to talk about that if you want to. I'm here for that. And so are the rest of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so let's learn to tell the story in both the way we live and the way we speak. Go in peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.